record. Okay. Starting the webinar. Good morning. We're going to give everybody a few seconds to log on. We'll get everybody in and then we'll get started in just a bit. Thanks for being here today. All right, good morning, everybody. I am Vicki McRitchie, the Executive Director for the Dana Point Chamber of Commerce. Um, joining us today is Capital Director Taylor Melody from Assemblywoman Lori Davies' office. Uh, the Assemblywoman was supposed to be with us today, but of course, emergencies in Sacramento called her. Uh, so she will be getting, getting busy there in Sacramento, but we're very, very delighted to have Taylor, very lucky that he can make time for us today. So Taylor, would you like to go ahead and take it away? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Vicki. And thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. Um, as Vicki mentioned, the Assemblywoman was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, Sacramento business with legislative deadlines coming up tomorrow sort of took her away, but happy to be here and kind of go over some of the bills that she's introduced so far this year, just to kind of answer any questions if you have on them or just answer any questions about uh, legislation that you may have heard of in the news so far. Perfect. Uh, so like I said, Begin. just wanted to create a little bit of a PowerPoint just to kind of give you a brief introduction to the bills that she's introduced. Constitutionally, tomorrow is the deadline in Sacramento to introduce legislation. So we've been busy introducing bills that we've worked with members of the community, members in Sacramento, um, and just different community organizations about some of the issues facing not only the 73rd district, but also the state of California. So Vicki, if you want to go to the next slide, I can read that off. Perfect. So the first main issue that the Assemblywoman has really heard a lot about, and obviously probably you all have well, is public safety. So she's introduced a number of bills, and I have them here kind of just listed if you want to read them. Um, I can go over them briefly. So 1598 is probably the jewel of the package so far. It's to reform California's drug paraphernalia laws uh, to remove fentanyl testing equipment. Obviously, fentanyl has been a huge issue, not only in Orange County, but statewide. So right now, under current law, testing strips and other material that would be used to test to see if a product is laced with fentanyl is actually considered illegal, which is why we've seen an uptick in accidental overdoses and unfortunately accidental deaths. So this bill would reform that to say that any testing equipment used to test for the presence of fentanyl or any analogs related to fentanyl would be no longer illegal. So that way parents, school officials, health officials, law enforcement would have access to these tools without being in um, uh, non-regulation with current law. And then we have a couple others, 1661 uh, reforms or updates California's human trafficking laws uh, for more warning posters inside different premises. 1750 sort of goes hand in hand with 1598. So right now under current law, if you're a probationer or a divertee convicted of a controlled substance violation, uh, you're supposed to get some sort of education and counseling training. The only problem is that training is not specified what the training has to be taught or what has- screen because I wanted to type. Uh, so this 1750 is to reform that and say what those trainings have to entail. So we want to make sure that we partner with law enforcement on this bill to ensure that any type of training that is required as a condition of probation tells about the dangers, either ingesting or manufacturing or selling of controlled substances. And then Vic, if you want to go to the next one. Perfect. So the environment, obviously don't need to tell anyone here about the horrific events of the OC oil spill that happened in October. As you may or may not know, uh, you know, allegedly the vessel that hit the pipeline during an anchor strike in January never told any state or federal authorities until afterwards that they thought they hit a pipeline. So in response to this, Assemblywoman Davies has introduced AB 1611, which would say within 24 hours, if you are a vessel that hits or even potentially thinks you hit a pipeline in state waters, you must notify federal and state authorities so that way they could go in and look at the infrastructure to determine if there was any damage or not. Um, if they don't do so, it would require a $50,000 penalty um, to the owner operator of that vessel. 
And then healthcare, obviously a huge issue. I'm sure a lot of you probably have heard in Sacramento uh, recently that they defeated the AB 1400 single payer. Um, obviously, the Assemblywoman was not supportive of that measure. However, is supportive of trying to bring access to healthcare to our communities. So the first one, uh, AB 2145, would allow certain uh, dental professionals the access and ability to go into skilled nursing facilities uh, to not only help with treatments related to dental hygiene, but also then give training to the staff to the, of those facilities to make sure that if they have any types of issues that someone is not available to come and check out the uh, resident of that facility, staff is trained on how to manage that. There was a study that was done at the end of last year, I believe, that said that due to the pandemic, this vulnerable population was the most one who was left out of care altogether because with facilities either being locked down or not being able to access those patients just due to a variety of reasons, uh, oral health care was a severely lacking treatment for a lot of uh, nursing facilities in the state. So this bill sort of in response to that. And then the next one after that, uh, still to be introduced today, uh, will allow nurse, certified nurse midwives and licensed midwives to receive grant education training under the state Song Brown workforce training. So what that is, it's a state program that says if you are a certain type of medical professional, uh, you could get grant funding to help pay off student loans, pay off student debts if you're a certain professional. The problem is certified nurse midwives and nurse midwives um, were not eligible for that funding. So if we want to get more people to our hospitals, to our clinics, uh, to our state, frankly, uh, we need to make it as easy as possible for them to make sure that if they go to school to become a healthcare professional, the state gives them options to help pay off those student loans. As I advance the slide, if you guys have any questions, feel free to pop those into the Q&A or chat box below too. And then last one, uh, education, obviously another huge issue that we've kind of heard a lot about, especially as it relates to the masking issue now that the state deadline has passed. So real quickly, um, one that's probably been in the news recently, AB 1785 is the California Parents' Bill of Rights, which basically enumerates a lot of existing laws that are already afforded to parents. So, you know, the right to make certain healthcare decisions for your kid, that's obviously not preempted by state or federal laws, uh, the right to use California's parent family leave, you know, those sort of things. However, what this bill actually then ends up doing is adding on to those. So it requires school districts to actually give more information um, to parents about certain things that are going on in their school or their curriculum. Um, and then going down to another one that's probably important, at least to this specific chamber, uh, 2028, would allow school districts to give trainings to students on how to operate e-bikes, motorized bikes, and motorized scooters. Obviously, we've seen a lot of news recently as it relates to kids getting into accidents or even adults getting into accidents. Um, right now, schools are allowed to give this sort of training, but only to regular bicycles. So what the Assemblywoman has come up with is updating existing law to now kind of come to face to face with um, innovative technologies that we've seen, like I said, e-bikes, motorized scooters, that sort of stuff. And that comes on the heels of her going to partner with not only the OCTA, uh, but I think the uh, county sheriff's office to put together some sort of events, hopefully in the next couple of weeks with schools and Capo Unified uh, to sort of create like a one-stop shop event where people could come look at how to ride e-bikes, talk to manufacturers, talk to sellers, talk to law enforcement about what it takes to ride these products safely. And then last one, uh, happy to answer any questions for anybody uh, about either stuff, like I said, I've mentioned or anything going on in Sacramento that you've heard. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, let's see. Have a hi, Vicky. That's very <laughs> that's a good question. Um, we have what is the best way to obtain the results of bills passed? Is there a full review on Lori's website? Yeah. So the best way to do is actually it's the public website for all legislation. It's the uh, Cal Legis website. So if you just basically go to Google and type CA Ledge Bill Info, you could type up individual bills, um, and you could kind of view their status, view committee analyses, view votes. Obviously, the Assemblywoman's website will be updated with where her votes and where her, or not votes, excuse me, where her bills go. But if you want to look at other things that aren't the Assemblywoman's bill, but maybe there's a bill out there that you've kind of had your eye on or of interest of, that's the best, easiest way because it updates every night. Fantastic. Any other questions, feel free to go through and pop that in the Q&A. What do we kind of expect from today? What kind of any bombshell things happening today? 
Um, it's sort of, you know, as I was telling someone yesterday in a meeting, you know, it's sort of a fun time for us in the legislature because all interim and fall time, um, you know, everyone's always working on their own legislation. And now because of the deadlines introduced by tomorrow, you know, it's sort of cards on the table for everybody, right? It's sort of, okay, what have you really been working on? What are you introducing? So I think a lot of the big items that we're going to hear of this year, um, a lot of vaccine, a lot of COVID related items, those have already been popping up. Um, especially being in the super minority, you know, a lot of things for us that we want to focus on are the housing issues. I know our caucus has been really focused on a lot of the housing issues, a lot of uh, public safety items. Uh, reproductive health has been a huge item that we've seen so far too. So I think there's a lot of good things that are going to be coming this year that the assembly will hopefully get involved in uh, and just kind of make sure that we have a say in the matter. Another question that came in has been, uh... Has Assemblywoman Lori Davies been involved in supporting any military initiatives for bringing home Americans from Afghanistan? Uh, so I think that is more of a federal issue. Uh, she does not have the jurisdiction to sort of request that. Obviously, I think that's more of a congressional issue. Um, she does, however, a couple have a veterans bills. I didn't mention them on here uh, just because they're still sort of in works, but she does have a couple of vet bills that she's working on specifically. As we know, for-profit colleges really target veterans. Um, and not to say anything negative about them, but there is a history of them trying to go after them for their GI benefits. So one of the bills that she has introduced this year, um, not on the slideshow, but it is AB 1730, uh, would allow veterans the opportunity to sue and get um, treble damages if they were the victim of unfair business practices. So under current law, you're allowed to sue if you're a senior citizen or a disabled individual. So what she's doing is updating uh, current civil law and allowing veterans the opportunity to sue for treble damages as it relates to veterans on the on the bringing home from Afghanistan. Again, we don't have jurisdiction over that because we're a state level. And then I think a good question too is obviously you see everything that's so divisive right now in politics, whether it's federal or state and it's party versus party. Has Assemblywoman Davies had any luck reaching across the aisle? Has she made some friends up in Sacramento from maybe oh, the other side? Absolutely, absolutely. I can I can rattle off a whole list of bills that she's on as a uh, co-author and working with uh, Democratic legislators on, but it's specifically to our bill. So the fentanyl bill I talked about, AB 1598, she's co-authoring with some member, Chris Ward, uh, who represents the San Diego, San Diego area, excuse me, uh, who's a Democrat. Uh, our veterans bills that I didn't mention, she's actually partnering with Sharon Cork Silva, obviously a Fullerton, to work here. Um, she's also part of a huge coalition of 40 other legislators, most of them Democrats, on a Senate bill to increase the renter's tax credit. So right now, under current law, it's about $100. I know it's, excuse me, it's $60 if you're a single filer and about $120 if you're a joint filer to uh, file for a renter's tax credit. That has not been updated since I believe the 1970s. So she's actually part of a large coalition to update that to make it now a single $1,000, no matter if you're a joint or single filer, uh, to keep up with the price of inflation. And that's being led by Senator Steve Glazier of uh, Orinda, which is a city in the Bay Area. Awesome. Dwayne Cave, did I miss anything? You're my go-to. <laughs> you know, I think, I think I'd like to hear more about what's happening up in the state as far as now that the mandates for masks are off, what, what is the, what's happening up in Sacramento? Uh, what do we have to look forward to in the next month or two? Yeah, absolutely. So recently, as of just last night, the governor announced that he's going to be introducing uh, new measures and potentially executive orders as it relates to not only doing ending the pandemic, but just making this an endemic as sort of something to live with. One of the big items that we've been really pushing, kind of hearing a lot about is obviously the masking in school children. Um, you know, that's sort of a big issue that we're sort of fighting. For the moment, the governor said that for the next two weeks, at least, uh, and Dr. Galley, who's the head of the CDPH, um, said that that's going to be continued practice until they get more data on if it's viable to remove masks in children. So I think that's one of the big things that we're going to look at. Um, you know, as far as mandates and everything, the governor's state of emergency is still in effect. So there's been a couple of attempts uh, by Republicans in the state legislature to end that. Unfortunately, those have not gone anywhere uh, just because we are in the super minority. Uh, but I think that's something that we're going to work towards is sort of leveling off from the state of emergency and going back to a sense of normalcy. Do we see the uh, even even on the on the majority side, do we see more of the members in the majority side moving towards ending the mandate at this time? Do we see more cooperation? Uh, I, I wish I could say yes. They, like I said, they tried to do a resolution literally last Thursday to get rid of the emergency powers. 
um, and it wasn't even brought up for a vote. They killed it procedurally before it could be brought up for a vote. So I, I would love to say yes. And maybe, like I said, once Governor Newsom and um, Speaker Anthony Rendon, Speaker Pro Tem of the Senate, Tony Atkins, maybe once all of them sort of get on the same messaging phase, maybe we'll see something sort of as a level off. But as of right now, everyone's kind of happy with the status quo, unfortunately. That's unfortunate too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I said, I think we're nearing the end. I really do. I think you're starting to see some people sort of really uh, get tired of it. But until the governor and the uh, body leaders do anything, rank and file have no choice but to sort of follow along. Very good. And I missed the very beginning of the show. I had a hard time logging in. I'm sorry about that. But did you say anything about... Uh, the the time has passed to submit bills that's closed correct or is that yes. closing in okay no that time. that's closed tomorrow um so january uh -huh. mid-january was the time to submit language into what we call our legislative council to craft bills and then tomorrow is the legislative deadline to introduce okay excellent so if anybody has an idea for a new bill what happens uh you send it to me and i put it in my 2023 legislative folder <laughs> Um, like I said, we're always happy to work with folks. Um, you know, it's that's what we did during this interim. We, we talked with community members, you know, we talked with different organizations in the community to try to see what was the most pressing issues. And, you know, going back to the beginning, public safety is what we heard first and foremost. Uh, the Assemblywoman is a co-author on a number of measures, mostly Republican, unfortunately, but to try to repeal or at least reform Prop 47, as we've seen a lot of those kind of issues throughout the state, as it relates to the uh, grab and go kind of crimes that we've seen. Um, Speaker Rendon, Anthony, uh, Speaker Rendon of the Assembly and uh, Speaker Pro Tem Atkins were actually just on a radio interview yesterday that I was watching uh, when they were asked about Prop 47 and if they were interested in sort of reforming it and they sort of hemmed and hawed about it. So we'll have to see if that goes anywhere. Obviously, crime is a huge issue, not only, like I said, in the 73rd, but everywhere. So we're going to have to see if there's any real appetite to try to do something on that. And we also had AB 1400, which was the single payer health care that that did not uh, move on this year. Uh, are they holding that for next year, do you think? And and what's the mood about about that bill? Um, I think there was a lot of celebration that that bill did not pass, not only from the Republicans, but for a lot of Democrats, because it was sort of something nobody wanted to take a vote on. Um, it passed out of the policy committee of the health committee, but you had a lot of the members on the left say that they're passing it just procedurally, just so it could go to the full floor for a vote, but they weren't going to support it. Uh, and it was never even brought up for a full vote. It was eligible, but never brought up. And then what you saw kind of ironically was it was sponsored by the nurses union. Um, and afterwards, the author, Ashkara, you know, put out a statement that he wasn't going to bring it up. And the nurses union actually went after him and said that he was weak and not principled for bringing for not bringing it up. So he said that he's going to work on it again and try to bring it back next year. Who's to say that's going to happen? I mean, it's sort of, you know, bite the hand that feeds you. You know, he was doing what they thought was a huge favor um, and to his colleagues, not wanting to put a lot of members in a bad spot, but it, it's, it's always going to be out there. I think every year you're going to find some type of iteration. The only difference between 1400 this year and the previous version in 2017 was this one actually told us how they were going to pay for it. And unfortunately it was $163 billion tax, which equaled out to about $12,000 per household in California. Um, and in an election year, nobody wants that on their, you know, their, closet, so to speak, you know, a skeleton in the closet. So um, like, so the Republicans were never going to vote for it. You had some moderate Democrats and even some on the more progressive side say, look, we have support single payer, but you can't pass $163 billion a year bill. So yeah, almost double our, our taxes at that point. So yeah, so it's something that that uh, we're all going to keep an eye on as we move move into next year. Exactly. And like I said, that's why the Assembly woman has introduced the healthcare measures that she did, because she's trying to bring access to care to those vulnerable populations. Like I said, senior citizens are obviously vulnerable in their skilled nursing facilities. And then the certified nurse midwives, if we can get more types of healthcare professionals into our communities, that's how you lower costs is because instead of having to drive two or three hours to visit a certain professional, if they're in your own community, you know, it, it saves time and it saves money. Okay. Well, Taylor, I don't see any more questions. Vicki, do we have anything else that you've received? We have one question about um, the state has a $30 billion budget surplus. Is there anything that Assemblywoman Davies is doing to get some of those funds directed locally? 
Yeah, absolutely. We're working with some of the local cities right now on budget uh, requests. Um, like I said, if anybody has anything for their chambers or uh, cities that need type of funding, like I said, please feel free to reach out to myself or Miranda uh, Payne, who's on this meeting as well, or anyone in our office and Figueroa, I'm sure some of you all know, is our district director. If there are funding needs for cities, for improvement projects, for schools, anything, please feel free to reach out to us. That's, that's what we're here for. We could submit budget requests to the budget committee, um, hopefully get them into the final budget for community things like that. So if there's anything that people need, like I said, please feel free to reach out to us on that kind of stuff. Okay, well, thank you very much, Taylor. We appreciate you being here. We're sorry that the Assemblywoman couldn't make it on, couldn't make it uh, in person herself, but, but we appreciate you giving us the update today. No, absolutely. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. And Taylor, any, any last closing words that you have for us? Um, thank you all for being here today. I like, you know, <laughs> please, please support the assembly woman, I guess, stuff like that. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, thanks a lot, Taylor. Appreciate Perfect. it. Thank you all. Appreciate it. So let's move on to our, our legislative up, updates. We're going to move on now to uh, Congressman Mike Levin's office and Terry uh, Van Horn. Well, good morning, Dwayne. Oh, am I unmuted? There. Nope, you're good. Okay, good morning. Uh, good to see everybody. Um, you know, I only have two things today, so it's going to be short. Big news, and I just want to make sure I get this accurate. Um, Rep. Levin and Daryl Issa partnered and reintroduced legislation to prioritize San Onofre for spent fuel nuclear fuel removal, which means they, re they reintroduced the uh, Spent Fuel Prioritization Act, which prioritizes the removal of uh, the spent nuclear fuel from, uh, the de from decommissioned nuclear sites in areas A, with large populations, B, with high seismic hazard, and where the continued storage of spent nuclear fuel represents a national security concern. So as you probably already know, there are over 9 million people living within 50 miles of songs, and we experience some of the greatest seismic hazards in the country, as well as being located on Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton. So um, this bill would make songs one of the highest priority sites in the nation for spent nuclear fuel removal. And it's also co-sponsored by uh, Rep. Peters, Rep. Steele, Rep. Porter, and Rep. Kim. So it's got some great bipartisan support, <clears throat> excuse me, support. And then uh, one additional item, uh, they, the DOE has moved forward on another one of the congressman's bills to actually you know, start the siting process again, because one of the main problems here, which has been a problem since the beginning is where are we going to put the spent nuclear fuel once we decide you know, that San Onofre is number one on the list, we still don't have a place to put it. So. That was also something important that happened last year. And then one more thing. So I guess there were three. If there, if you guys know anybody out there that may have gotten a notice from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid about the fact that they owe uh, Medicare, uh, you know, back or they call them overpayments, where the agency overpaid a constituent. Basically, what happened is that they determined Medicare in their records went back and determined that some of the doctors that they approved bills for were not Medicare approved doctors. And this could have, this could have uh, been for an appointment that you had that as far back as 2014. So I've been handling a few cases. I haven't had a lot, but there are a lot of letters floating around out there. So if you know anybody, let them know they can contact our office if they are unable to resolve the issue directly with Medicare because they, are, they, they have retracted those letters and they are not holding anybody responsible to pay those overpayments. Um, there are some people that will just pay it. So um, if you know anybody that's gotten any of those letters, um, please contact our office. We'll be happy to help. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Dwayne. Thanks. Well, thank you, Terry. We'll stay on. Don't, don't put yourself on mute yet because uh, for those that may not be following on chat, we have a question about from, from Marilyn Gardner and she's mm -hmm. the co-founder of PAL and you answered the question on chat, but we know undergrounding has been a, a, a big topic in Dana Point, undergrounding mm -hmm. overhead utility lines. And so she's asking the question about federal infrastructure funds to South Orange County undergrounding. So you gave that answer and if you can maybe elaborate a little bit more. Sure. Um, yeah, we started working with the city of Dana Point um, 
on the community project funding requests. Um, as soon as we found out that you know they were a possibility last year, and I don't remember exactly, maybe it was about a year ago, we started working on these projects. So we identified um, you know, bridges, roads, those kinds of things that need to be repaired. And we're still waiting actually on that first list that will, it, it will be part of the appropriations package, which won't get passed until a budget is passed. So we're still, you know, we moved it again. I think the new target date for the continuing resolution is uh, it's good until March, mid-March. So we're hoping to have, you know, something passed prior to that. We just have to sort of wait and see. So fast forward, we also in conjunction with the new infrastructure bill that was just um, passed into law, we are also looking to see if there's any funding available that might be able to be used, you know, at the city level for undergrounding. It would, it, you know, the city comes up with some of the money, the federal government can match some of that money. Um, when it comes to the infrastructure bill, though, there's, you know, there's specific rules on who gets that money and what it can be used for. And right now it looks like it's being used to mitigate, you know, fire hazards in high, uh, you know, um, in high fired fire hazard areas. It's the only words I can pull, pull high, out high uh, this morning. Thank you, high risk areas. So we're, but we are looking at our um, policy team, our legislative team in DC is helping us to make sure we identify anything that's coming through that infrastructure bill that can be applied to cities and to undergrounding because we are looking specifically for Dana Point. They are the ones right now, uh, San Clemente. Our other cities in the district haven't expressed that uh, as, a, as a strong need, uh, not, not as much as Dana Point. So we are watching the funding closely as it is rolled out. Well, very good. I'm sure Marilyn and Len and, and the whole PAL uh, coalition will be following up with you on this as well as mm -hmm. following up with the city. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, next next, let's go to Senator Pat Bates' office and we have Candace Burroughs. Candace. Good morning, everyone. I um, uh, hope you're all having a great day. Uh, Senator is back up in Sacramento. Lots of going on as was said, stated earlier um, by Taylor, tomorrow is last day for any um, legislation to be introduced. So all the committees are full, everyone is busy working. Uh, Senator Bates just introduced a new bill uh, that provides a tax credit to uh, any um, uh, company or business that sponsors a um, a blood donation. We're really very low on blood donations. And so she's uh, introduced a bill to give a tax credit to places that will host um, uh, a blood donation. So that might be helpful to move that forward. Um, our office has still been uh, very busy with um, um, people calling in who are opposed to uh, Senate Bill 866. And 866 is the bill that um, is uh, being introduced um, by um, Atkins and Min and um, Josh Newman. And, and they um, are discussing trying to get um, our existing law changed for vaccines to include, um, I'm sorry, I've given you the wrong number. It's 860, 871. I'll tell you about 866 in a minute. But 871 is to include a mandatory uh, COVID-19 vaccine along with the hepatitis B uh, for all students seventh grade and above. There's been a lot of controversy over this because in the past there has been a medical exemption and they're trying to eliminate any medical exemption in these bills. They have not uh, been assigned to um, uh, a hearing or anything yet, but um, the other bill in question that people are calling us about is 866, which is the... Um, uh, max mandatory vaccine uh, 
of children 12 years and under and allowing schools to allow those children to get vaccines on campus uh, without parental consent if they're um, 12 years or older. And uh, once again, a lot of parents are very um, uh, concerned about this. And um, we've been very successful, the people in the community, uh, by stopping certain bills like 1400, was, which was the single payer bill that um, we've had some difficulty with. And fortunately, the calls that came in were helpful because people, as uh, uh, Taylor said, the people in Sacramento just didn't want to touch this because they knew it was so controversial. So we're encouraging people from our office to continue to call and especially call um, Tony Atkins, Dave Men, and Joss Newman and let them know that we're they're in opposition of this because the more opposition that comes up, the more attention they seem to pay in Sacramento. I mean, it, it's it's really overwhelming that um, they don't understand this, but um, if you overwhelm their offices with phone calls, they can't get their work done. So we're encouraging people not to call the Republicans because they've got those Republicans on their side. They're always against these bills, but it seems like some of the Democrats don't want to listen to um, the other side. So um, it's it's a pretty partisan situation, obviously, up in Sacramento. And um, uh, the Senator is moving forward with many bills. We'll be able to have a review of her bills uh, next month. But at this point in time, um, until we get everything finalized um, tomorrow, it's difficult to give you a complete uh, rundown of what's happening and what committees things have been assigned to. So it'll be a busy, busy um, year. The Senator is the most, um, she has the most committees and the most meetings of any senator uh, in 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 Sacramento uh, because of the limited number of of, of um, members on the Republican side and the number of committees up there. She has been, been assigned to the most and and carries the heaviest load because she's vice chair of most of those uh, committees that she's on also. So she's a very busy lady representing you, but we're in the district office here, always willing to help. I believe Rhonda is monitoring this call. And um, we also have our district office in Encinitas that is helping out. So um, if anybody has any questions, I'm here to answer them, but uh, I don't have much else to report today. Well, thank you very much, Candace. Appreciate it. So let's move back to Assembly Member Lori Davies' office. And I know we had a great presentation by Taylor, but Miranda Payne, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, Taylor went over all of our, our ledge. Um, so I, I think he was the best authority on that. So I'll leave it there. But I do want to say, um, following in Candace with the blood drives, um, we are still really low on blood in the state. Um, and we are going to be hosting a blood drive with Red Cross uh, on March 7th. That's a Monday. Um, we're going to be doing it at the San Juan City Hall. We'll be there all day, uh, me and uh, the district office managers and Figueroa. Uh, so if anyone would like to come down and donate some blood, um, we will be there donating. Um, and then you can also just go to Red Cross online um, and they have a bunch of um, appointments that they're just eager to fill. So um, again, if anyone is able, we would really appreciate it if you could do that. Um, but that's really all I have to report. So thank you so much for having us. Oh, you're on mute, Dwayne. Okay, thank you, Miranda. Appreciate you being here today. Um, next, let's go to Supervisor Lisa Bar Bartlett's office and we have Sergio Prince. Dwayne, uh, great to see everyone. I'm gonna leave my information in the uh, chat box in case you need to reach me for anything. Um, first of all, I wanna give a shout out to uh, Vicki and Katie on an outstanding um, chamber installation and awards dinner last week. Uh, Supervisor Bartlett really appreciated um, participating in that and that was a job well done. Also hope everyone had a happy holiday weekend with uh, Lincoln's birthday and the Rams winning the Super Bowl and, um, and a happy Valentine's Day. It was 
very fun. Um, Supervisor Bartlett is uh, flying in as we speak from Washington, D.C. She represents the County of Orange um, on NACO, a National Association of Counties. Um, so um, she'll be back here shortly. And uh, we're looking forward to participating in the Dana Point Festival of Wales coming up um, in the first weekend in um, March. Um, always uh, look forward to that and we're happy that we can be out and have some kind of sense of normalcy again. Um, the county has launched a Orange County Micro Business Grants Program, um, uh, dispersing grant awards uh, for $2,500. The application period closes uh, March 15. And you can get more information or apply for the grant um, uh, through uh, oc1stop.com. There are eligibility requirements. Uh, um, business um, must have fewer than five full-time equivalent employees and fewer than five full-time equivalent employees in uh, the 2019 and 2020 taxable years. Uh, you must have be, uh, began operation prior to December 31, 2019, and you must currently be active and operating or uh, have a clear plan to reopen when the state uh, permits reopening of the businesses. So um, any small businesses that would qualify, we urge you to um, apply for that. Um, Supervisor Bartlett uh, will be um, delivering the state of the district, fifth district, on March, um, I'm sorry, May 5, uh, it will be held at the uh, Laguna Niguel Community Center. And we appreciate the support of all the chambers, um, including the Dana Point Chamber, and also the uh, South Orange County Economic Coalition, which is being um, very, very helpful in promoting um, the state of the fifth district. And, uh, and lastly, um, uh, our office, Supervisor Bartlett, is in discussions with uh, Dana Point Harbor Partners in in properly memorializing uh, Don Hansen, who, who passed away um, last month, and memorializing him in the harbor in, in a very proper way. So we look forward to a, um, an exciting announcement about that too. So anyways, uh, feel free to reach out. If we can be of any service, um, don't hesitate to ask. Hey, Sergio, any update on, on your position for, or the county's position with the mask mandate too, now that that's gone off? What, what's the county recommending? Well, the Orange County Healthcare Agency is still recommending wearing masks. Um, however, uh, you know, I, I know we've been to a number of events where it seems like that's not um, being enforced or, or was being enforced or practiced. And honestly, we believe people should have a choice, but the health, Orange County Healthcare Agency is still recommending um, wearing masks in, in um, certain situations. Thank you very much. One more question. and and. Uh want to see how the process is going for the Orange County Registrar of Voters with Neil Kelly resigning or uh, retiring. Now you have an opening there. How's that process going? We have a primary coming up in June, then of course the general in, in November. So yes, the Board of Supervisors uh, has selected uh, um, Neil's replacement and that that announcement is forthcoming. Perfect. Okay, very good. It's, it's good to get them up and running. Mm -hmm because the June election will be here before we know it. Thank you very much, Sergio. Okay, next let's move on to the city. We have Kelly Renders for the city of Dana Point. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I will just go through a series of quick updates for the city. On Tuesday night, the city council had their first reading of a local ordinance addressing SB9. And uh, while the council understands the need to create housing, they also um, look to balance that with neighborhood character. So if you're looking for um, what that um, ordinance will contain, there's a good summary in the staff report that was presented Tuesday night. Um, also, um, working with um, SDG &E, Dwayne was there on Tuesday night. We're doing a uh, establishing an undergrounding uh, utility district for Stonehill between the high school and Palo Alto. Um, that project um, was eligible for Rule, rule 20A funds. And um, basically the city will um, work with SDG&E to get a project designed bid and then that project will go back to city council. We are delighted that the city council um, is memorializing Don Hansen by designating um, the city portion of Dana Point Harbor Drive as Don Hansen Memorial Drive. And 
that sign will be installed in probably less than a week and we'll have it up and ready for our Festival of Wales um, participants and visitors to enjoy when they come into the harbor. So we're thrilled about that and uh, are working with uh, Donna to get that, um, that, that sign will be installed probably in a week and then um, kind of revealed uh, shortly before Festival of Wales. Um, we are updating our strategic plan. There was some discussion at city council about it um, this last Tuesday, but we'll be bringing it back to council after we get some feedback from them in individual briefings. Uh, the council also is moving forward with Waterman's Plaza and we are contracting with Bill Linebrook to create a statue of Steve and Barry Bainey, who are Dana Point locals, um, been here forever and championship tandem surfers among other many, many things they have done in the community. And obviously most people know they um, uh, started Infinity Surf and that just went through its 50th anniversary, gosh, maybe a year or two ago. So long, long time Dana Point folks. We are going to initiate the next phase of our utility box um, wrap program. So that will be going to city council in March and we will be um, continuing to beautify our utility boxes around town. Shipwreck Park was recently completed. We had a ribbon cutting for that um, very quickly before the city council meeting on Tuesday and park was already filled with kids even in the rain. So we were really happy to, to see it was being utilized right away. And we had our final hearing for redistricting the district maps um, that were established for the 2018 election um, have not changed with the 2020 census. So there is no changes to our districts um, here locally for our city council elections. And that concludes my updates for the city. Thank you, Kelly. I'll tell you, it was a jam packed city council meeting, wasn't it? It was jam packed, but very efficient. Extremely efficient. I was, I was very, uh, impressed by how quickly everything went and uh, how well the, the council members got along. It was just, it was a great meeting to see. And we I'll are tell you very about, lucky, and, very lucky. We have a really good city council and they're really um, thoughtful and efficient with how they, they uh, do the city's business. Yeah. And it was great to see Don Hanson getting, getting the name of his name on, on that portion of Harbor drive that's in the city of Dana point. I was, I was real happy to see that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, let's go to the tow roads and uh, Jeff Bott. Good morning, good morning everyone. A uh, quick update on tow roads. Last weekend, um, we installed um, some channelizers on the northbound 241 at the 91 freeway merge eastbound. Uh, these are long cylindrical traffic cone type things. As you know, for many years, people going down the 241 in the afternoon, merging onto the 91 eastbound, um, that's about a mile back up. Some people drive on the westbound side and try to cut in line. So that is no longer going to be possible. It's rude, it's unsafe, and it's gonna stop right now. So we installed those last weekend about a mile up and that'll be uh, much safer and uh, prevent that from happening in the future. Hopefully people don't drive over those cones, they probably will, but at least um, be a little bit of deterrence for now. And it's hard to believe, but it's just a year away that we are going to start construction on the uh, 241-91 direct connector uh, from the 241 directly into the 91 express lanes. And that will open in 2025, 2026. Uh, can't remember if I mentioned last month, if I did forgive me, but uh, your mayor, Joe Mullert Miller, uh, was voted in as vice chair of the 241 toll road for a second year uh, with mayor, <coughs> excuse me, with Peggy Wong of your Linda as the chair in her second year as well. That's my update and have a great long weekend. Hey, thanks, Jeff. And I bet you the uh, the toll numbers on the going going uh, westbound on the 91, I bet you the drivers going that direction really increased when they found out they couldn't <laughs> change over to the right. <laughs> so I, I, yep, I've, I've been in that backup many times. So it's that this is long overdue. So that's great. Okay, next let's move to our chamber update. Last but not least, Vicki. Um, I feel like 
Jeff is targeting me because I was definitely the person that would uh, cut in front of people. So those cones are going to directly impact me. Um, it's fine. Um, anyway, so lots going on here at the chamber. Um, to Dwayne's earlier point, we will be hosting a webinar with the Registrar of Voters in, I believe it's April, um, just to talk about the upcoming elections and the whole process there. Um, as Sergio mentioned, the micro business grants are available. If anyone needs any assistance with filling out those applications, absolutely go ahead and reach out to us. We can assist you. Um, as uh, you guys all know, the indoor mask mandate ended on February 15th for vaccinated individuals, um, and we continue to have masks available here if anyone would like to continue giving those out, but obviously, um, I think Orange County has been kind of going by their own rules for quite a bit, so <laughs> again, we have them available if anyone needs them. And the Dana Point Civic Association is going to host a chat tomorrow via Zoom with Sheriff Don Barnes. Uh, that's at 8.30 in the morning, again, via Zoom. I just put the link in the chat. So if anybody would like to attend that, that could be a great thing. Um, we hosted our installation dinner and annual meeting. Thank you, Sergio, for the shout out. We honored some great individuals. So we, we didn't host the event last year. So we did honor our 2020 Citizen of the Year, who is Jody Marcon. Jody was the artist behind those mystery surfboards that popped up all around Dana Point. Um, like the true Banksy of Dana Point that she is, she was not able to attend the event, uh, continuing her mystery but she will be at the Festival of Wales Parade. So you will actually get to see her face, which is very exciting. Um, and then our 2020 business of the year was Wind and Sea, who um, gave out more than 47,000 Mai Tais during the pandemic, which obviously helped us all to get through. Um, our 2021 ambassador of the year is Kathleen Fox. 2021 citizen of the year is Jack Logan Solo, who prepared meals on a weekly basis for our homebound seniors, uh, all on his own dime and time. And our 2021 business of the year was Dana Point Hardware, all very deserving individuals and businesses. And we were delighted to be able to honor them in a public fashion. And then finally, we have a mixer tonight. It's a joint networking event with the Lagoon and Nagel Chamber of Commerce. It will be held at Brio Restaurant, um, kind of right there on the border of Lagoon and Nagel and Dana Point. And that starts at 5.30. That's all I got. Okay, well, thank you very much, Vicki. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here today. I want to thank our panelists for their, their uh, presentations and their reports. And so I hope to see everybody tonight. I will be going to the, the mixer tonight because why not go to Brio? It's a great place to go. So I'm going to support, support uh, a local restaurant. Anyway, have a great day today. Uh, shop local, shop Dana Point, and uh, we'll see you tonight at Brio. Thank you. Bye guys, thank you.